I'm delighted to welcome Kelly Richter to the podcast. She's an EVP and Chief Marketing and Client Experience Officer at First Command Financial Services, taking care of U.S. nation's military families and their pursuit of financial security. Kelly, welcome to the pod. Alex, it's a pleasure to be here and great to meet you virtually. Glad to talk to you today. Awesome. Look, I think there is, first of all, First Command and its mission, and I'd love mm-hmm. to to dive into that in a little bit. But I think the part of, about your background that kind of goes beyond this initial introduction is that you've been at the leading financial institutions in marketing and experience and strategy roles, and the, these are organizations like American Express and AIG, and now you have the special mission at First Command, but let's start with your title, because I think this is my favorite title ever, (laughs) Chief Marketing and Client Experience Officer, because in some ways, I think every marketer should be a leader in in customer and client experiences and vice versa. So tell us about the story in the title, and we'll come back across your richness of your backgrounds later. Sure, sure. Yeah, my pleasure. So Alex, I've actually listened to a few of your podcasts and I've heard you say on more than one occasion that everybody is in the business of client experience. So maybe everybody needs that in their title. But when I I was asked to join First Command, I was actually recruited as the chief marketing officer and I was recruited to focus on the company's brand. And when thinking about the company's brand, we had to get clear. I I like to call it the three C's. And I actually learned this during my tenure at American Express, who is very brand focused. And it's the three C's. It's clarity of your mission. Who are you to your clients? It's, It's consistency and consistency of the client experience at the end of the day. A lot of times people say, that it's the a bad experience that's the enemy of good brand, but the reality is it's an inconsistent experience that is the enemy of a strong brand. And then the last is control of the three Cs. Nobody controls their brand anymore today because as we all know, anyone can say anything about you online no. and folks are really in the driver's seat about what they view and they listen to and they consider and believe. And so when knowing you can't always control it, it's like focus on that consistency and inconsistency. What is your experience? So as a brand, I like to say the brand is who you say you are. We are the personal financial coach of our nation's military families. And then the reputation Mm. is what others say about you. Right? When you're not in the room. It's, when it's, you're not in the room, what are they right, saying yeah. about you? What are they saying about first command? And the trick is to make sure that what you say about yourself and what others say about you are very tightly linked. It's when they're not consistent and you're saying one thing, we're, we coach our clients toward financial security and someone has an experience that is different from that promise. And that is what breaks trust at the end of the day. So we went on this relentless pursuit of how do we make sure that our brand and our our experiences is our reputation. And so one of the first things I asked my boss was, can I add client experience to my title? Mm. And I actually asked for that. And the reason I asked for that change in title is one to add personal accountability to it. I If my name and my title is on our website and folks see that, what I find is often I'm the first person they reach out to if they have a great experience or if they have an experience that is different from what they expected. Mm. And so with that title, it it carries a lot of responsibility and it it also carries a lot of accountability. And my job every day is to make sure I'm earning that title and that I'm taking calls and emails and chat messages that are letting me know that we're doing a good job being consistent with our brand promise. I think this is remarkable. It's really a job of a CEO to ultimately be the owner of that customer experience. And quite famously, you could find the CEO of the world's most customer-centric company, Amazon. Jeff Bezos was available, was receiving emails, would typically, like when he would get a bad email, he would forward that to his team 
was a question mark or something like yes. that. I'm assuming you're a little bit more inclusive and positive around that. But I think it's amazing that not enough people are stepping up and connecting mm-hmm. the dots and right? like people go into their comfort zone. I am a brand person. I'm a product person. Right. Uh, it all and ultimately, if you believe in the mission and vision of customer centricity, you're, you've everybody's got to be in this business. I'm curious if there are other people that are clamoring to take that title or like other parts of organizations that are, if not taking it, they're like, hey, I'm really interested in what you're hearing. Is yeah. it, have you become the source of customer wisdom within First mm-hmm. Command? I'm the source of it, but I share it. And Mm -hmm. in one of the very first initiatives we embarked on and making sure that we were customer centric is actually including in all of our employee training and our, all of our employee onboarding that we all own the customer experience. So helping all of our employees and frontline, especially understand what is unique and special about the clients that we serve. I I remember listening to one of your podcast guests. I think her name was Mary Pop, and her name stands out because it's very familiar, a childhood story name. But she mentioned how important it is to have the employee experience, a focus on that employee experience, because it's so closely linked to your end customer experience. And we believe that's true. And making sure that employees are empathizing with the unique challenges of our military clients understanding that, understanding our mission, our vision, and making sure they're equipped with the tools and resources they need to deliver a great client experience at the end of the day. So we do, well, I have the title and that is a privilege. It's a responsibility and there's accountability that goes with it. We also make it really clear as employees are onboarding and as they're continuing throughout their tenure at First Command, that they understand they affect the client experience and we all own that jointly. I think this is brilliant that we're all, it seems like the most sophisticated organizations really do connect the employee experience with the customer experience. And I think this is great to hear that resonated with you. One of the things that is probably interesting when you mentioned the word control, and I think military, right? Everybody thinks command and control structure. And then I quote you from one of your podcasts, you say the control is no longer, this yeah. is a fallacy, yeah, <laughs> the control fallacy. is in the hands of consumers. It's so I, you know, do you have some folks that come and work with you, have their own military background or are more yes. used to, to that kind of traditional approach? The hierarchy, you know, the, military the command and control changing, leadership. Right? It it is changing. It's evolving. And they realize they have to evolve with the population and with the trends because they have to recruit just like employees and and companies have to recruit. And they've got to retain their talent as well and be relevant to who they're trying to recruit to the military. But I love that you pointed it out that the military kind of comes from a traditional command and control background because that historically has been the way that First Command has has approached financial coaching to the military. It's let me tell you how and what exactly you need to do in order to take control of your financial life. But what we realized over time is that our brand really represents coach. And what Mm -hmm. that means is our advisors are not only coaches, but everybody at First Command is a coach. And so the experiences we deliver to our clients who happen to be from military families, they're either active duty, they're veterans, they could be military dependents or military Mm -hmm. spouses. They also want a coaching experience that is tailored uniquely for them. That basically means that this is not a one size fits all approach to financial planning. It is coaching meeting that person where they are. And so we actually embarked on really understanding what is our coaching philosophy. So Mm. if our brand represents coach and we want to provide an experience that is a coaching experience, they want, we want our clients to feel like they're being coached, not told what to do, but you're not being drilled. You're not, this is not not your your drill sergeant. Financial boot camp. This is more. (laughs) Yeah. Well, yes. this is this is fascinating. And I, I if I could draw one of the parallels, I'm curious what you think about that. So mm. one one of the interesting areas that we found that there's a lot of pent up challenges around 
is an, an employee benefit um, decisions, right? Like educating mm. about the range mm-hmm. of employee benefits. And some of them are financial, obviously, but some are, could be health and wellness and insurance. But educating about them, making the right decisions, reducing the stress around that. And what's interesting, historically, you would do some sort of a webinar, maybe send out a bunch of documents or have something internally on your sort of secured internal portal. The problem that we found is you the word keyword that you've used is families and dependents. And sometimes mm-hmm. the decision maker was not the employee. Like in your case, it would be maybe not the active military member, right? It would be their partner, right? And the partner may have maybe may, may very complementary and very different decision style to that person, right? And so tell us a little bit about how you combining this holistic approach to families and different styles of making decisions that could be within the single family. Right. Oh, you bring up such an excellent point that initially we focused always on our primary client who in most cases is the active duty service member. Hmm. But what we learned after 16 years of monthly research where we're in market every month with not only military, active Mm -hmm. duty military, but also their civilian counterparts so we can understand the unique differences between the two and their attitudes about finances. One of the things that we learned through that research is four out of five military spouses are responsible for the family finances. So it's not the active duty service member who is our primary client in most cases, it's their spouse or partner that's managing the finances because that individual happens to be home. Usually the one who is not a full-time employee, as you might imagine, military spouses have some really unique challenges for career continuity because their active duty spouse or partner is constantly having to be moved to a new duty station, a new location. They may be deployed. So this person is the continuity in the finances and in the family. And so it doesn't really surprise us in the end that 80% of them are managing the family finances. So So paying attention to their needs and what they uniquely are are challenged by. So I love that you you called that out because that is exactly what we learned through our research. I think it's almost universal that you, you sometimes assume one thing. Yes. And it turns out something else. And yes. I could even say it, I'm not, I'm very supportive of the U.S. military as a, a naturalized U.S. citizen and somebody who came as a refugee to the to U.S. I, I just really admire the sacrifice and the commitment and the esprit de corps inside, inside our armed forces. But I think on my own little thing, like I treat the startup and the entrepreneurial journey as my kind of little mini test of of survival but guess what like the primary decisions in our home lives are not you know i'm not the ceo i'm not right. the founder i am right. like a lowly lowly <laughs> pawn in the yes. in execution <laughs> mode here yep. and i think it's it was a shift right like i think because we you think one or the other but eventually i think most couples find some sort of a balance and i, I think it's just too easy to get caught up in the in a kind of who's our first customer and i think a lot of organizations fail so i think tell me a little bit about what was that journey discovering that you said it took 16 mm-hmm. years and time and after time was this like an like obvious da moment at some point you realized this or were people saying hey are, are we talking to the right thing was it changing as the society was changing and the roles were changing Guide us a little bit on your perception on that. I'd love to say we identified it ourselves, but the truth of the matter is that First Command has a military advisory board. So we have an independent fiduciary board of directors, but we also separately maintain a military advisory board. And that military advisory board is made up of retired senior enlisted and senior flag officers from all of the branches of the service. What we do uniquely, however, is Mm. we include the spouses of those military advisory board members 
in our two-day conference that we hold quarterly. So we have one day with the board members themselves and the second day with the board spouses and partners. And what we learned is what was unique about the spouses is they were managing the finances. Got it. They were the ones that were advising on many instances about what was challenging about the military life. And they said, you really ought to be paying more attention to military spouses because while the service members have their unique challenges, military spouses also have challenges. They're, they're trying to maintain that continuity in the home, but they also are trying to, in many cases, hold down a career of their own, which is difficult to do when they're constantly moving, which then talking about employee benefits in our earlier part of the conversation, they never have a chance to vest in their 401k because they're having to change employers. So that disrupts the family finances. And so you start to really understand that this whole situation with the family is not just about the active duty service member and the challenges he or she may be facing, but the partner or the spouse is also having those unique challenges. So how do we at First Command understand what those challenges are, and more importantly, create the type of experience that is supportive and conveying that we empathize through that understanding and offering the solutions that speak directly to military spouses? I am very glad that our military families are in your safe hands because it sounds <laughs> like there's a lot of love and care and attention that you put in there. Tell me a little bit about where does this come from? Where do you draw being able mm -hmm. to connect and surge out these human experiences for yourself? Is it early mm -hmm. in your career? Mm -hmm. Is it like some memorable experience from pre-career, from childhood right. and teenage years? Yeah, Tell, like, you know, what it's... are memorable experiences for you? Sure. Okay, I am I am the the child of one of four children of two parents who are both educators. And when I think about the unique challenges of educators mm. is for the most part they are working for about 9 months of the year. We had summers off so we got to enjoy camping and touring the U.S. and learning a lot about the country, but we never did anything without trying to learn something. My parents were always teaching and mm. it's embedded in me. How do we learn? And, and so I, my philosophy is never, never stop learning, never outgrow learning. And that's why I'm always curious about what else we can learn about mm. our clients and our customers. And I think a little bit about my career, and I've been in financial services my entire career spanning over 30 years now. And I think early on in my career, it was all about, am I doing good work? Are people going mm -hmm. to recognize my work ethic? Are they going to rec recognize the output of my work? And I was fortunate that I had leaders early on that did recognize that. And through that process, was able to get organically promoted within a large organization at that time, mm -hmm. American Express. And, and then I started to think about, I had a family of my own and is this work working for me? Like you start right. to get into this work-life balance challenge of how do I juggle a full-time job, going to graduate school, pursuing financial licensing, and having a family? And it was those demands that were a priority for me. But as I started progressing my career, it's much more about is what is my work doing for others? And that's yeah. what really attracted me to the mission of First Command. And I know I'm not alone on that one at First mm -hmm. Command because we do text analytics on our Glassdoor and Indie career site reviews. And far and away, the biggest item that attracts people to working at First Command or to keep them here at First Command, for that matter, is our mission. And it's really the purpose. And we are a for-profit company, but our chairman likes to say, this is the most mission-driven for-profit organization you'll ever know. If I connect this to the startup universe, there's very clearly divide between mission-driven organizations and kind of merc like mercenary, and to use the kind of obviously yes, plan words yes. context. Yeah. And I think it's very real. And you can mm -hmm. see in Silicon Valley, for example, there have been like, all right, people just hop from one hot thing to the next hot thing. And it doesn't matter if it's related. It just has to be hot. And they're, can I catch the right wave and maximize my options? And But the really the most impressive people that I've met found an organization where they really aligned with the mission and the vision 
and stuck with it and worked there for many years, Mm -hmm. different roles, continued to learn. Because I think that you, if you're one organization, you know, you got to switch, maybe try different things to stay on top of it. But that seemed such a more fulfilling way to have a demanding career and show an example of commitment to kids in the world, which bombards them was like shiny objects left oh, yeah. and right, consume yes. this, consume that try this, right? Like it's this menu of options that we think is great. Not sure it's that great all the time. I think it's good to have some choices, but it's not great to have too much choices versus what really matters to me and then committing to that and and pursuing that with vigor. So it sounds like the the same is what's the same motivation is driving. People are self-selecting to work at first command. They are. And we know that through the text analytics, as I said, but the other thing is that this is such a mission and purpose-driven company. We are a private company, which is structured as an employee stock ownership plan. And what that means is we are all owners of this company. Mm -hmm. Um, But it also means from a cold-hearted government standpoint, it is a non-tax deductible business. In other words, we do not pay corporate taxes. So when we give to charitable organizations, in our case, most of those being military-based nonprofit organizations, those contributions actually come straight from company profits. And First Command actually gives more than 7% of company profits to service organizations benefiting the military and our local communities. And that's pretty interesting because I serve on a, a board of a nonprofit organization, and recently they shared with board members a study that less than 1% of companies are donating to charitable causes, yet First Command donates 7% of corporate profits. And that doesn't include the personal contributions that our employees and our financial advisors are making in their own communities. We did track over 25,000 hours of volunteer support last year, 36,000 complimentary financial plans for active duty military. So these are the ways that we demonstrate a purpose-driven culture that is in line to our mission. And I think that not only attracts the people to come and work at First Command, but it certainly helps us keep those people, even when there may be that shinier object or opportunity at a place across in Dallas from Fort Worth, where we are over on the western side of the Metroplex. So that's where we have a competitive advantage for folks that are looking for that. I, I can't agree more. I think back to what motivates employees. I could even say for me, right? There are like most nonprofits actually sign up and use our platform just like any irregular customers, but we can offer discounts. But I think one of the things that we started innovating is we've offered our to our team members to pick cause or charity of their choice and share the platform with them, the more premium capabilities. And I can tell you, people really get fired up about mm-hmm. that in a very meaningful way because it's their specialty, their expertise, but they're applying it yes to the bigger you know part of the organization but then to a very specific area that's so near and dear to them on a, per- on a personal deeply personal level and even for me like just picking oh i love this organization and i want to make sure that they succeed and i know they're scrappy can we help so it's actually really empowering from top to every to an intern who is like hey doing an unpaid internship but they get a chance to actually support a cause And I think that kind of echoes to the fact that we're looking for meaning in what we do. Now, tell me a little bit about this this context in terms of your customers, right? Like, Mm -hmm. how do you help untap the meaning? Because there's meaning from being part of a military family, but Mm -hmm. then there is meaning from bringing up a family, the security around that, all the other things that people have to balance to Where do you, how do you find it for your customers? Mm -hmm. And does it differ significantly from customer groups to customer groups? Yeah, there's probably not one answer to that question, but I'll give you at least a couple, I think that make the biggest impact. The first is that we recruit directly out of the military. So we're partners with an organization called Hiring Our Heroes. 
And they actually work with organizations, for-profit organizations to employ military veterans and military spouses. And so we recruit from the military, one, because that helps reinforce the culture. It also embeds directly this automatic empathy for those who have served and understanding on a level that a civilian can't necessarily appreciate about what it's like to be in the military. And then, in fact, 25% of all of our new hires last year were military spouses. So making sure that we demonstrate not just the active duty, but also the military spouses. We have military dependents as well. So there's that piece of it. But the other piece of it is... I think a lot of companies. So basically, hire your customers. Hire your like customers. That, hire your Look customers. like your customers. Sound yeah, like, like your, your customer. Yeah. Understand your customer. So that's rule number one, and I guess they call it the the platinum rule, which is not just the golden rule. Do it how treat others how you would like to be treated, but know yeah. how they would like to be treated, they and that treated, helps right. us. That helps us do that. But the other thing is a lot of folks will say, "Hey, we're customer centric," and certainly that is really critical for us. But what we had to do was understand, okay, what does that mean for our customers? What is the vision for what a great client experience would look at look like at First Command? So we did a lot of research with our clients. And what we, er- we understood is it's not just about being effective and helping them achieve their financial goals. To them, it mattered how they felt in that process of being coached by Mm. First Command, by one of our advisors, by the tools that they engage with at First Command. So we needed to understand what does that mean? What does that look like? And what we learned was so important to our customers uniquely is the fact that they wanted to feel respected. And that definition of being respected for our customers actually meant keeping their data secure and having current and accurate data, being able to address them by rank if they served in the military, being able to understand how long they've been a customer of First Command and where they are in their financial journey and where they need to go next. So this demonstrating respect is about having clean and accurate data so that you can personalize an experience in a way that demonstrates we know you, we value you. The other thing that we learned is it's got to be about support and how do, how does First Command support uniquely military families? It's about they know that they have a dedicated team that is there for them no matter where military life takes them. And if they're deployed, we may not have an advisor on the ground where you are, but we are here for you as a virtual advisor. So we're making it convenient and flexible for you. And last but not least, and it goes to hiring from the military or through military family members, it's that empathy. It's really demonstrating we know what it's like. We understand what's unique and challenging about your life. So it is really understanding those emotions and what the, how those most emotions are translated by our clients to deliver the experience that they say they are looking for. And that's how we keep the clients at the center of our actions and decisions. I love it. And and it's interesting that you brought up respect, right? Which is, let's say it, like it's the most fundamental human thing that we could be doing. But the way you've connected respect, what it means to the customers is, is, is slightly different maybe from a customer to customer. And it feels like, uh, it's respect is about again personalizing to that individual what the respect means to them that's right i'm curious as to when it comes to communications right because you're communicating things that are very complex mm-hmm. maybe the these folks are not financial experts that got degrees in in financial planning and whatnot right like on their in their spare time They probably joined military not for financial reasons, right? Like it's a different mindset. And you are right. And so you have a lot of, and yet you have the so much responsibility, family risks associated with active service are very different maybe than many other careers. So I'm curious as to how do you communicate that complexity in a way that's respectful Yes, and recognizes that people may be, some may be curious, some may be not curious, some may be linear, 
and how they want it to be like a book and some maybe a little bit more nonlinear and get to the answer quickly because they they can value their time and they know what they're looking for. There's different learning styles, different levels of expertise. We find that a lot of organizations historically struggle in, because they, here's a book on everybody and yes. good luck. And then yeah. we'll coach you on the side. But I think it, increasingly, if you can't be one-on-one -on -one physically with everyone and gets expensive, some right. of the self-guided resources become really valuable. What have you done or seen that's interesting in this area? Yeah, it's such an important point because we have the great fortune of being regulated because we are a registered investment advisor, a broker dealer, we have a bank. So we have all kinds of regulators, the Fed, the OCC, the SEC, FINRA, and many other state regulators that, that we answer to, which means there are so many requirements about how you communicate with your end customer. We have to keep all of that in mind, but mm. more importantly, keep the end customer in mind because what's really clear to our end clients is they value communications and communications have to be understandable and clear. And yeah. so it's really easy to get caught up in not only the legalese of what may be required as part of your communication, but also just the financial industry jargon. That means yeah. nothing to an active duty service member. And I love how you pointed out most of them are not joining necessarily to get rich, right? But What's really true is none of them deserves to be struggling financially either. So how do we clearly communicate to them a coaching experience that very often can't be done in person? We always make every effort to, we have 170 offices across mm. the U.S., most near major military installations, but we can't be everywhere they are. And so how do we convey a coaching experience through them, even if they're de dealing with their client login portal? And how do we help all of our frontline service associates provide a clear communication and coaching experience to our clients when they call us. And so it's really about helping them understand that your job is to be understood. Your job is not to push a message. Your job is to be understood. So we've got to communicate clearly and simply. And that's the challenge of every organization, but I think a bigger challenge for all financial services organizations, given that added complexity of the regulatory environment. So one of the things that we've noticed in regulated environments is that exactly this tension between you need to be compliant, but you need to be clear. So mm -hmm. let's say insurance products, right? AIG, that you worked with. So like, I mm -hmm. think every insurer that I've spoken with secretly wants to come up with an insurance policy on one piece of paper, like on right. one page. Like, right. What ends up, however, frequently happening is like lots of papers. And so people feel like somebody's hiding behind the small print. And then it sounds like what your whole philosophy is to say, you're more than a piece of paper to us. You're we're here for you. So, what have you found ways to combine the compliance with the simpler experience? Is that an ongoing journey? I, That's I like wish I had hard. the secret sauce yeah, to that, yeah. Alex. But what I will say is that it it is a challenge to combine the two. You always it, it, it's not just that you include the disclaimer language, it's that clients have to acknowledge the receipt of that. And so it, you can't hide it. You, you need to make it clear. And so for us, the journey is always, how do you be very transparent? We did research where it we found is that our clients really want to make sure that they have trust and confidence in their financial plan and in their financial partner, which in this case is first command. And so the, the only way to have that trust and build that confidence is to have complete transparency in how we make money, what our fees are upfront and clearly, and what the service model looks like and what their options are and, and communicating that very clearly. And if you can't do that in an in-person conversation, how do you organize the content in an online forum that is easy to navigate yeah. and make it easier for them to find their way through that information, which you're an innovator and an entrepreneur. 
And the most innovation comes from constraints. And that those are the constraints and the opposing factors that are always at driving us to get better at making sure that we're a clear communicator, but also a comprehensive and compliant communicator. Yeah, this is why what particularly draws me to regulated industries was a lot of additional complexity is the world that we live in doesn't care that you're regulated or not. You just, if you're, if you, was your role, was the title that you have, you got a yes and, right? Like an improv. Exactly. Right? I know you're a right. fan of Jerry Seinfeld. So this is like a, <laughs> yes. an improvisational thing. Yes. You got to go with the crazy, <laughs> with the Kramer in there. And this is, yeah. we're going to make this happen. And this has been where we've been trying to help folks, particularly in regulated industries, because it's not that easy. Like you said, okay, we'll just build website for everything and then like now and the document and so now you have to approve the documents approve the website that just increase increases your the length of time to market and everything from approvals perspective so there's these whether it's life sciences or insurance or financial advisory work there's uh, extra challenges i think that other organizations just take for granted right as a startup you could go build a website and sell your widget quickly it's yes. you don't have that luxury um, don't and, and and i think i'm glad that you're like the audience is in safe hands but i think a lot of people don't appreciate how hard it is that combination in regulated industries very difficult and since you opened the door to seinfeld i'll just share one Really interesting insight that he was, I saw an article in Harvard Business Review where they had interviewed Jerry Seinfeld. And of course I had to read it. And what he was talking about was his latest innovative project, which is cars, comedians and cars drinking coffee. And they're Mm. like, so why did you take this route? And he said, By the way, I was in that. I was in that. I'm in the Uh, coffee. Yeah, there you go (laughs) with your coffee mug. Yeah, I love it. And it's funny because he said, my whole career has been built around asking the question, what are people sick of? And in his case, as a stand-up comic or thinking about a traditional talk show where you're interviewing a guest and the, the host is behind a desk and the person comes in the, who's the guest who's sitting on the couch next to him and he does the con- traditional interview. So he wanted to think of, people are sick of that traditional model. So I came up with something unique and he used the example of the Savannah Bananas. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this minor league baseball team, but that was an innovation based on the fact that people were sick of the slow pitch of between nine long innings of baseball. Mm. So how could they create an entertaining experience throughout the nine innings? And they created that as much more of an entertaining way to bring out families and enjoy the game of baseball. So I'm always thinking about for first command, what are our clients really sick of? Right. Mm. And is it reams of disclaimer language? Okay. So, how do we make sure that we're delivering that transparent understanding of what they're paying for, what their rights are, how we keep Mm -hmm. their information secure, all of the things that are required to convey, but in a way that is digestible and understandable? So, those are the challenges that we're always thinking about when we're trying to deliver an experience that's relevant for the clients we serve. So I'm I'm curious since we are on the on the on the Seinfeld topic as well. Are you able to introduce humor in ways that kind of surprised you about its effectiveness in your organization? Obviously, we're I'm, we're slightly smaller, and we need to we can take certain risks. Even though we have very conservative customers, we could take risks ourselves, at least in how we go and communicate about us. I wonder what you do with humor, whether internally or even to customers? Yeah, humor is important, right? Because I think it helps people relax. It helps make it a more fun work environment. But when it comes to end client facing, you really have to be very thoughtful about the humor that you use and making sure that it will be received as intended. So one of the things that we really dial into, knowing that it's important to our customers that we're effective, that sort of table stakes, that what we do helps them achieve and and their path toward financial security, but more importantly, that 
they feel good. That's that emotion that we're it's, trying it's to feeling. convey. You're trying it's to get emotion, but it's not, you're not connection. going for the, for the laughter necessarily per se. Not really for the, sense of for, the, for the laughter. What you'll find in, in some of our traditional ads is we're demonstrating that we really understand. So for example, we have what's called the hero behind the hero ad. And what that is, it talks about everything that goes on between a service member who's defending our country and mm. our freedoms. But back at home, there's a spouse, a partner, a family member who is keeping the lights on, so to speak. Yeah. And so that hero behind the hero is that unsung hero. And helping us make that direct connection with them on an emotional level is really what's most important. It conveys that we empathize and understand. We don't necessarily try to connect on a humor level, and we better really understand what is humorous to our client before we do that. Got it. That makes sense. You don't want to be like risk-taking funny people for CFOs and financial advisors, right? <laughs> and effectively, you're the family's outsourced CFO it, to some degree, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's funny because we, we watch some of our ads and we all are like wiping our eyes and we're like, when are we going to do something where we're laughing? It, it, but it, we make that connection and and it, at least so far, it has been a really effective way to to convey our empathy. One of the topics that I want to bring back to it when we discussed before the call was your previous experience with other leading financial institutions. Sure. We talked about yeah. MX and we talked about AIG. You were in senior roles across mm -hmm. those organizations. Tell me a little bit of how are you seeing the role of customer experience, client experience evolving over, over not just single company, but over your time in the industry? Yeah. So when I think about early in my career, it was about protecting and promoting the brand. In fact, what's interesting about my early career at American Express Financial Advisors and then subsequently was spun off as Ameriprise is it was because of the fact that American Express was very, you know, rightly so, protective of its brand and the regulatory environment was becoming so restrictive on uh, broker dealers and registered investment advisors, they decided they did not want the risk to the brand. And, and so it was spun off as Ameriprise, which I was part of that Ameriprise spinoff. But I think about it was at, at as part of that spinoff, it, it was all about how do we get the brand to be known, right? Creating this brand awareness and growth through promotion of the company's products and services. And when you think about AIG, it was the tagline at the time when I was working there was the strength to be there. That was the tagline. And it was on Manchester United jerseys and had it was at that time the third most recognized brand in the that was, world. That was when Manchester United was Manchester United. That's you know, that right. Was, that, that was yeah, when it was, it was still a, Man U. And yeah. so that, that tells you I'm dating myself a little bit there in terms of my career. But it, it's all about about the brand. And yeah. today it's more about you had better be delivering value for that end customer. And if your, your product can be okay, your brand could be okay, but if you're not actually ultimately delivering value, that none of that matters. And so their clients and prospective clients are going to keep you honest on that. And so in, no matter how effective your advertising campaign is, right, it's not so just about the promotion. Your clients are more sophisticated, a little bit more cynical and keep you on your toes. They will. They'll keep you yeah. on your toes. They'll keep you honest. And social media is a force to have ally as an ally, but also one to contend with for sure. Got it. Kelly, what what other wisdom would you want to part, like as an educator, right? As a parent, right? Let's say there's folks that are early in their careers, they they want to be the next executive VP, the next CMO and head of client experience. What would you say one or two takeaways that somebody should start investing in right now in terms of their skills? Yeah, it, it's... I'll start with a really practical one, and that is really understanding data and the power of data, especially with the advent of AI and what insights that, that you can gain from appropriate use of, of data. 
and and what it can tell you and how it can point you in a direction. You have to always be careful and cautious of validating and verifying. But knowing and, and understanding how to manage data, data analytics, data insights will be a relevant skill set today and for many years to come, in my view. I think the maybe less obvious skill that is perhaps a lost art since COVID is having the communication skills to directly relate to your colleagues, your customers, your clients. We know that the generations today that are coming into the workforce are really digitally native, but they may be missing some of the lost art of relationship skills. And rather than sending an email, you might be able to better connect with mm. your colleague, with your customer by picking up the phone, stopping mm. by their offices if it's practical and you actually are working in an office or a workplace where you are collaborating together physically. But it's the lost art of relationship and communications that I think may not be as second nature to a lot of the folks who are entering our workforce today. Got it. Perfect yin and yang. Yes. The brain and the heart coming together. Go. That's it. To define the future of marketing and client yeah. experience. Kelly, such a great chat. Where can our audience learn more about what you're doing and what First Command is doing? Firstcommand.com has a great website. Obviously, if you Google First Award Command, winning, you'll... by the way, number like how many? Three times you won the best, the best financial services websites in your career. Oh, yeah, I, yes, we have, but it's not about the website. It's about the <laughs> the content in it and the brand we represent. And yeah, so please do learn more about us and and Google us. You'll get to see some really great stories that our clients have to say about us because at the end of the day, it's really about them. I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing your insights, and thank you for taking care of families of American military. Thank you. It is our pleasure and our privilege and my privilege to get to know you, Alex. A great conversation today. Likewise.